Hello and welcome to Effective Data Visualization. My name is Husni al and I'm a PhD candidate at Carnegie Mellon University. Throughout this talk, we'll be using several Python libraries, including NumPy, which will handle numerical operations in Python, uh, Matplotlib, which is the main uh, basic plotting library in Python, Seaborn, which builds on top of Matplotlib to um, more straightforwardly create statistical visualizations, uh, Scikit-learn, which is the most common machine learning library in Python, and Pandas, which will help us organize um, as well as import data in an easy to work with format. We will also work with several data sets, most of which are historically standard statistical data sets uh, that we'll be able to import from Seaborn or Pandas directly. Uh, but we'll also be using a data set on financial stock market uh, data and also a data set on COVID-19 cases. Um, if you have not done so already, uh, you could run the first cell uh, to install the required packages. Uh, the following few cells, I like to put them at the start of every notebook. Uh, here we're basically importing some of the libraries that I mentioned earlier. And we're also making figure sizes bigger and making sure that if you are on a Mac that we are uh, seeing these plots uh, at a retina display resolution. Uh, now this tutorial is presented in five major parts. Um, the first is on data um, is on density estimation or estimating the distribution that created your data. The second is on exploratory data analysis, which is going to include some of the first things you might want to uh, try out uh, when you get your hands on a fresh new data set. Um, the third part is on visualizing high dimensional data set. Uh, where we will talk about reducing the dimensionality of high dimensional data set uh, using machine learning methods so that we can uh, visualize them on a two dimensional screen. Um, and then the fourth uh, part is on interactive visualization, uh, where we will be using the Plotly library to create interactive plots that you could um, interact with. <clears throat> and finally, we'll talk about uh, communication. Uh, which is just going to include a few tips about how to make visualization choices uh, to communicate well and to avoid common mistakes that may uh, mislead your audiences. We'll start with density estimation. Uh, so when you get a data set, sometimes you're interested in the process that may have generated uh, this data. Does the data, for example, correspond to a normal distribution or perhaps a Poisson distribution? Is the data bimodal or is it skewed? Um, and other things like that. Uh, so to help answer this question, we could look at a few uh, ways of plotting the data. Uh, first up, we're gonna talk about the histogram. So first of all, uh, let's look at the data that we're gonna make and then see how a histogram is gonna look on, on it. So our data set is from biology. It's, um, it's about some iris flowers. Uh, that there are three species um, in, for, of these plants um, and they have four properties. And um, so calling iris at head is gonna show us the fi first five rows of this uh, data frame or the stable. And this is in a pandas format. Um, so let's say we pick um, one, uh, one feature as our data and we want to look at the histogram of that. Then we can simply do plt.hist. Uh, so plt is matplotlib.pyplot that we imported earlier. Um, and it's going to show us, you know, what, what, what is the density of our data. And it's going to look something like this. Um, it's... It's the one thing that's really important in histograms is the number of bins. Uh, so depending on how you choose your number of bins, histograms are gonna look drastically different. Uh, so let's look at you know, the same thing, but we're plotting, uh, we're plotting it with five bins and with a hundred bins. And we're plotting it on the same, um, you know, on two plots side by side and see how that looks like. So obviously, you know, these look drastically different and neither of them are, um, 
you know, very representative of the uh, density of the data. Something, uh, some other choice in between is going to be, um, you know, a better choice, probably something that looks like this. Uh, but essentially, you know, with histograms, we can um, figure out what the underlying density of the data that we have. So I have some, you know, statistics here. If you want to read, um, you know, more formal definitions of what a histogram is, but my point, the point that I'm going to be trying to make here is that um, a histogram is an estimator. It's a statistical estimator, and it's going to have uh, a certain error. And this error is related to the choice of, um, it's, it's going to be related to the choice of the number of bins as well as the number of data points that we have. And this error is going to go down for an optimal bin number. It's going to go down with the number of data points. Uh, but it goes down pretty slowly. And there are better estimators than a histogram uh, that uh, can do better with less data points. And the, the, um, the way we can achieve that better method is by looking at kernel density estimation. So in kernel density estimation, essentially, instead of, um, instead of just binning things and counting the number of things in each bin, uh, we're going to look at every data point, and we're going to put um, a, a function on that data point. And that function is going to look something like a, like a top hat function, or it's going to look like a normal Gaussian distribution. Uh, the important thing is that it's going to look uh, symmetric around the mean of that data point. It's going to be positive, and it's going to sum up to 1. Um, <clears throat> and essentially, after we put uh, those you know, boxes on top of each data point, we're going to sum them all up. And they're going to give us uh, a better estimate of the density of that distribution. So you could think of a kernel density estimation as sticking a box on every um, on every data point and then summing those all up. Um, so let's see how that looks like. So we can use Seaborn uh, Seaborn.kde plot for kernel density estimation plot. Uh, we're going to give the data the same as what we gave here, uh, which is just a sepal length. And then uh, this property is the bandwidth. So similarly to histograms where I said uh, the choice of the number of bins is going to be really important, here the bandwidth or the width of this uh, kernel that we're going to stick on every data point is going to be really important. Uh, and you can play around with this number, so if you make it really large, it's going to smooth things out, uh, whereas if you make it really small, it's going to look more like this case. So let's see how that looks like for another. Yeah. So if we make it really large, it's going to smooth things out. It's going to um, smooth the underlying density. We're not going to get a lot of information. If we make it really small, we're also not going to get a lot of information. It's essentially. Um, just showing you where the data points are and not uh, being useful in estimating the underlying density. So something like this is going to be more uh, reasonable. Of course, Seaborn does have uh, methods to try and, and um, you know, figure out what's a good um, bandwidth. And it does so pretty reasonably as well, but it's important to uh, still try to play around with this number and get a feel of how it's going to change. Uh, now, if we do the same uh, error analysis as we've done in the first in for histograms, uh, we can also look at the same uh, expected error for a kernel density estimator, because it's, it's just an estimator like a histogram. Um, now this, uh, now this uh, error is going to depend on the bandwidth as well as the number of data points. But for an optimal uh, choice of bandwidth, the expected error is going to go down more quickly than a histogram with more data points. Uh, so objectively, it's going to give you a better estimate of the underlying density. Um, 
Th this is, of course, assuming that uh, we have an optimal choice of bin number and bandwidth. And generally, that is not something you can simply calculate. Uh, but under that assumption, uh, a kernel density estimation is going to be a better estimator than a, than a histogram. And um, theoretically, we cannot do any better than a kernel density estimation uh, because it has uh, the minimum maximum error, um, which is an idea in, in statistics that I won't go very much into. Um, but statistics tells us that essentially we cannot do better than a KDE to estimate the underlying density of our data. Right, so now um, we, we have an exercise and um, I'm gonna pause here for uh, five minutes uh, for you to try to um, do this exercise. Uh, please let me know in the chat if you have any questions and I'm, I would be happy to answer. Oh, I got a question from Chris. Chris said um, he got an error when running KDE plot. 
with the missing one required positional argument data. For this one, you can turn to the beginning. The data is defined as the item, uh, sorry, iris CPO length. So here you can define another data, one for the X axis and one for the Y axis. Oh. So I think Chris might be referring to um, the case where it's still a one-dimensional uh, KDE plot. Is, is that right? Um, and in that case, uh, you could you know define x equals theta or um, and another way to define it, um, depending on the Seaborn version you're running, you might be running an older version, but you could do something like uh, x equals CPL uh, length and then data equals data. And that, that might work. Uh, also, a really cool and useful thing uh, with these Jupyter notebooks, um, if, if you're unaware, if you press a shift tab inside a, a function, it's going to give you the documentation of that function. Um, so if I do that here, I get that um, this KDE plot requires an X argument. Uh, and then everything here are keyword arguments, so you have to specify them. Uh, so if you're doing a two-dimensional thing, you would have to do y equals something uh, and so on. If you scroll down, you could read more about the documentation uh, of that function and you could do it for, um, you know, for any function you're in. All right, so I think the five minutes are up. Uh, let's uh, try to solve this together. Uh, so if we redefine data as iris um, and let's have, um, so here we said the pedal length and the pedal width. And then uh, let's just do first uh, some scatter plot of how this data looks like. So I'm going to say x is pedal length, y equals uh, pedal width, and then data equals data. And it's going to look something like this. Uh, one other nice thing about Seaborn is it's going to give you um, the x and y axis names uh, without asking for them, uh, which is not true for matplotlib, you would have to uh, you know, enter those yourself. Now let's try to do this uh, kernel density estimation in 2D. So this KDE plot, um, you know, x is gonna be the pedal length and then y is the pedal width. And let's see if that works. And we get something that looks like this. Uh, and just to explain a little what this means, essentially every, um, every curve here is a line of equal density. And then um, you know, you're going to see areas here and here. Those two areas have the highest density, uh, whereas you know, the, the further you go down in levels, you're going to have lower and lower density. So essentially, it's like a histogram telling you that this area here has the most data points, these, this area and this area, those two areas. And then as you go further, you're going to have less and less points. Uh, Seaborn also has another kind of um, you know, uh, 
density plot called this plot, where uh, it could give you multiple kinds of um, you know estimators that overlays them on top of each other, so you could see how uh, how they look like. So here, if I do this plot, um, I give I give it the pedal length as the x. Uh, feature and then I set KDE equals to true. It's going to show a histogram uh, overlaid on top of that. It's going to show the kernel density estimator. So you get both uh, in one shortcut. Um, so this concludes our density estimation part. Uh, please let me know if we if you have any questions. Uh, we're going to go into a ten minute break now. Um, but I'll, be, I'll still be available to answer questions in the chat if you have any. But during the break, attendees can use the chat room to ask questions or unmute yourself to engage in any chat. Or if you uh, prefer using the Hoopalish, you can go to the Hoopalish channel to search for different attendees to chat whatever you want. And you can also ask the speaker questions, not just about visualization, but also the speaker's research interests, anything related to Py PyCon. Matt is suggesting to um, do this plot in the chat. So I'm going to check out how it looks like. Cool. So this is essentially a 2D histogram of um, you know, those two features. I wonder if we could set KD equals true on, on this one. I guess not. So this is essentially doing the same thing as um, this, basically, but using a histogram instead of a kernel density estimation. Right, so we have a question from Ben uh, about this KDE plot, the two-dimensional one. What are actually the meaning of the lines? So the lines are levels of how much density they trap inside each line. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what the defaults are, but you could essentially set levels equals to, and let's say 50% and 90%, um, and then you would get two lines the, the outer one traps 50% of all your data and the inner one traps 90% of all your data. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the defaults are, but, um, but yeah, they're essentially levels that trap that co confidence intervals on your data essentially.
Uh, yeah, it, one, one comment is that it looks like a, a topographical map. It's essentially, it's essentially that where the higher hills are the areas of higher density. Um, and Drew is asking what aspect of cosmology I focus on in my own research. Uh, so I work on extra galactic uh, cosmology. I work specifically on uh, something called weak gravitational lensing. And it has to do with the shapes of, and sizes of galaxies. And if we study those over time, we learn things about uh, dark matter and dark energy. Um, so that is essentially what I do. I work on a new upcoming uh, experiment that's called the Rubin Observatory. Um, and it's essentially a telescope that's gonna take images of galaxies um, for 10 years at a rate of 20 terabytes per night. So I have a question about the, um, the KDE plot. I noticed in yours, you put X equal data and Y equal data. I didn't do that and I got the same thing. Here's what I put. Yeah, um, you could also do that. Um, so, so this data uh, variable we have is a pandas data frame and it's, um, it's in something called a TIDD data format. Uh, and Seaborn uh, accepts either specifying exactly what the X and Y are or specifying their names uh, and then having a data equals, uh, you know, iris. We can, we can simply specify those names and give it the data frame in the end. Um, in that case, we would have to just specify the names in that data frame. So it's either that, or you could give it um, the data directly. It also seems cool to me to share something about uh, Seaborn. Seaborn has three major breakdown of the plots. The first breakdown is the relational plot. The second breakdown is distribution plot. And a third breakdown is categorical plot. For the relational plot, we can draw scatter plots and line plots. For the distribution plot, we can plot hist plot, KDE plot, another called rock plot and empirical CDF plot. For the categorical plot, Seaborn provides strip plot, swarm plot, box plot, violin plot, point plot, and bar plots. And I'm going to share a IPYNB file as an extra material if, if some of you are interested to read. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and we're gonna look at some of those kinds of plots in the next section as well. Absolutely.
Great, we're gonna start in uh, one minute. Uh, if you, in case you missed it at, um, at the start, um, do try to install pip install stats models. Um, as I think I missed it from the requirements file I sent earlier and it's gonna be uh, useful for the next uh, sec section. Cool. Um, so Matt is asking for some uh, intro to stats material. I will um, send around some articles and uh, books after the tutorial, um, maybe in the Hugelo lounge um, uh, to like introduce some of these concepts for some background reading. All right, um, so the second part of this tutorial is gonna be on exploratory data analysis. Um, so we're going to look at this new um, data set called ANSCOMBI. Um, and um, essentially, this is a really interesting data, data set. It includes four different data sets. And all four different data sets have the same summary statistics. So if we loop over each data set and ask um, Pandas to describe it for us, it's going to give us some summary statistics. So if we, do, if we run this line, um, we, we're gonna see that essentially every data set is gonna have an X and a Y. Uh, each one of them has 11 data points. They all have the same mean, the same standard deviation, um, and I think the same uh, range as well. So that's the minimum and the maximum, or maybe not quite, uh, but they all have the same mean and same standard deviation, uh, which is really interesting because you would think that they all look you know, very, you know, pretty similar if they have the same summary statistics, uh, but they can be surprisingly different. Um, so let's look at, um, essentially just, let's first look at some scatter plots of how this is gonna look like. So if we just do a scatter plot um, and I'm just gonna copy this over So it looks something like, I don't know, something you could fit a line through. X and Y are both increasing at a similar rate, uh, but there is some noise. And um, a lot of the times you actually wanna try to fit some line through some data, uh, not, for the, not necessarily for the purpose of prediction, uh, but you know, for at least for the purpose of exploring, um, you would wanna fit a line through a data at least I do this by eye most of the time when I look at some new data. Uh, so you could ask Seaborn for a linear model plot uh, of you know, the same data. And uh, this height is just essentially gonna control the uh, size of the figure because for some of the plots, they don't uh, actually follow the convention we set at the start of the don't poop of the figure size. Um, and they, they rather use this height parameter. So uh, if you do that, Seaborn is gonna uh, fit a line through the data and give you some um, measure of standard deviation. Uh, that's uh, essentially the shaded area. Um, so one would think that, you know, that the second data set is also gonna look similar, right? Um, so why don't we try that for the second data set? But if we do that, it actually looks drastically different. Uh, it's obviously not a linear model. Uh, it's something completely different. It actually looks uh, very, it actually looks quadratic. Um, and sorry, I should specify, it, it is a linear model in the parameters. It's not a linear model in the data. Um, so it's still a linear model, but it's a second order linear model because uh, it's a second order in the data. So 
Seaborn actually lets us fit a fit a second order uh, curve through it just by specifying order equal equals to two. And you'll see that um, we get a perfect fit. And um, you know, keep keep in mind that as we said at the start uh, of looking into this data set, it has the same mean, the same standard deviation, the same range, the same number of data points as the first data set, but it's something that looks completely different. Uh, which is why um, you know, which is why data visualization is so important in exploring new data sets. Just by looking at summary statistics, you won't be able to get as much information um, on you know, your new data. So it's always important to do some exploratory plots to figure out uh, what your data actually looks like. Okay, let's try to do that for the third data set. Um, so again, the third data set looks drastically different from the first two. Um, it looks like it's a line with one um, outlier. So we would want to fit it, we, we might want to fit a line through it, but when we do that, we would want to ignore this outlier because it's going to influence the line drastically. Um, so let's actually try to do that with an order equals one. Right, so this single outlier has shifted the line, um, you know, drastically, and it's, it, you know, if, if we want to do a linear fit throughout this uh, data, we might want to disregard this outlier. Um, you know, first of all, we would want to learn wh why this outlier exists, uh, what created it. Is, is it some kind of anomaly? Is it kind of some biased data point or something like that? And if that's the case, we might want to ignore it. So uh, if we want to do that, we can just set robust equals to true. And that's essentially going to ignore outliers. And essentially, we um, fit a line through this data, ignoring this outlier. This uh, CI equals none is essentially setting the confidence interval to none. So it wouldn't try to calculate um, this uh, um, you know, confidence interval uh, just because it's going to take too much time uh, with the way it's implemented in uh, Seaborn for this particular kind of data. All right, so going back to our um, IRIS data set, And then um, one thing you could do is that you could color different species. Since we said there are three species in this data set, we can still plot the petal length and the petal width, but we could color different species with different colors. Um, so, and, and we can do that by specifying the hue parameter. So if we do that, it's gonna look something like this. Uh, so we have a really short exercise here, probably just going to pause a couple of minutes. Um, and it's essentially asking to use this LM plot uh, to fit three linear models into uh, each of those species all on the same plot, um, all on this plot, essentially. So I'm going to pause for like a couple of minutes, and then um, we're going to do that together. And in the meantime, feel free to ask any questions that you might have up to this point so far. I also want to say that I'm not advocating uh, to fit a line through every uh, data set that you have, um, but it, it is something that you might want to do sometimes, uh, and it could be useful. And Seaborn provides this uh, really nice shortcut to do it uh, without actually, um, you know, doing 
too much, uh, you know, statistics or data analysis for that. All right, hopefully you've had the chance to try that out on your own. Um, but essentially we're just gonna do an LM plot. Uh, the X is gonna be the pedal length. Y is gonna be the pedal width. Uh, hue is gonna be species. And then data is iris. And then let's set a high parameter equal eight. And that's essentially going to do, um, you know, everything the exercise asks for. All right. Um, so we talked about kernel density estimation. Um, joint plot is a really cool uh, plot that Seaborn has. Essentially, it does the kernel density estimation, but it also gives you the marginal distributions for each of the X and Y features. Um, and let's see how that looks like, and I'll try to explain a bit more what I mean. So it gives us this kernel density estimate that we've looked at earlier, but it also gives us a distribution uh, for the X and Y features independently and plots them right here. And then there's, um, you could do this essentially for every, um, every combination of features in the data set. And since we have four different combinations, you know, you might not want to, you know, just repeat this code uh, four times or uh, even more if you want to do it, if you want to replace the X and Ys uh, and things like that. And that's where pair plot comes into play. So essentially, if you just give pair plot the data as iris um, and then color things uh, according to species and um, essentially just run that, it's going to give us this um, joint plot for every combination of parameters. It's going to take some time to run. Um, but essentially, it's going to plot, uh, you know, pairs of features. Let's look at this one, for example. It's going to plot, you know, the sepal length versus, versus the pedal width. Um, and then, yeah, it's just going to plot pairs of these um, figures for every two, every combination of uh, features. And then along the diagonal, it's just going to plot the marginal distributions or the, you know, distributions of uh, each one of those features um, for each species independently, since we specified hue equals species. And that's essentially you know, a, a single uh, plot that is going to give you a lot of information about the data that you have. Um, and you know, essentially, everything we've been looking at so far has been this plot, the pedal length versus the pedal width. But this could, you know, give us uh, some insight on all of the different combinations of um, features in our data set. So, so far we've been talking about um, quantitative data. What about categorical data? Um, so there's, you know, a lot, a lot of different uh, categorical plots that Seaborn could uh, make. And essentially, um, you just want to um, ask for a cat plot for a categorical plot, specify the X and Y parameters, 
and then the kind of the plot, and this could be like a box plot or a violin plot or things like that, and then just give it the data and uh, the size of the figure. And that's essentially gonna give us a violin plot of those three species. Uh, and it's gonna give us, since we specify, uh, since we uh, specified the y-axis as the pedal width, it's gonna give us um, essentially the violin plots for the pedal width for each of those three categories or species. And the violin plot is essentially a box plot, but it gives us an idea about the overall distribution, not just um, you know, the summary statistics, not just the, um, um, just the median and uh, quart quartiles. Uh, so a short, a couple of exercises here, actually, we're probably going to stop for uh, 10 minutes while we do these ex exercises. Um, essentially, we're get, you're going to look at three different data sets uh, and create some um, plots that we've worked on so far for each of those three data sets. So one of the data sets is the flights data sets, and it's essentially um, a number of flights um, uh, over, uh, over a cer certain number of months uh, back in the 50s or 60s, I think, uh, really old data set. Um, diamonds, which is essentially a, a data set about diamonds, their uh, you know, sizes and prices and colors and things like that. And I, I should have um, removed this uh, cell actually. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, the third one is the Titanic data set. And um, the, the question is to make a box plot of the fare of the ticket paid uh, for each passenger on the Titanic. Um, and it's gonna be a categorical plot where uh, the two categories are whether a person survived or not. And we're gonna pause for about 10 minutes here uh, while you try out these exercises and then gonna do them together um, after that. Thanks, Hasti. So one important aspect of uh, the categorical plot is how to in interpret the um, shape of the violin or the shape of the box plot. What would you say about the plot that you plotted for Satosa versus color species and Virginica for the violin plot? Like um, what's the shape that's going to be informative and what's the string from a vertical line talking about something related to statistics of the three variables. Yeah, that's a, of the a two really variables, good point. Um, yeah, so, you know, some conclusions you could draw from this plot, for example, is that the Setosa is going to have shorter uh, pedal widths. Um, mm -hmm. But not just that, it's also a very um, narrow distribution. So the pedal widths uh, are very concentrated in this range. Whereas the Virginica, uh, not only are the pedal widths uh, larger, but the, also the variance between the different pedal widths is also larger. So it's not very concentrated around a small range of widths like the Setosa are, uh, but it's also, um, you know, it varies um, a lot. It has a lot, a lot wider variance essentially from um, you know, 1.2 pedal width to up to uh, 2.6 or so. Yep, absolutely. And I want to add one thing regarding box plot and violin plot is that if you, anybody see the dark black string, the upper point shows the third quartile and the lower tip shows the first quartile, which is 25th 
per percentile. And for example, if you have 100 data points, the 25th data point is located on located at the first quartile and the 75th um, smallest or the 25th um, highest value will located at the third quartile. Yeah, absolutely. So it's this is essentially a box plot um, with with a distribution overlaid. Is essentially. Uh, yeah. And I would argue that one unquestionable advantage of the violin plot over the box plot is that aside from showing the statistics that the box plot can also show. The violin plot can also show the density of the distribution at any point. Right. Yeah. But absolutely. those, the wider of the width, it shows that more data point will fall within that range, that bins. <laughs> but the box plot just shows how variant the data will be. So that I will recommend you using violin plot over the box plot for this reason. Yeah, essentially um, the box plot is only gonna give you some summary statistics, whereas the violin plot is gonna give you all of those plus the density distribution of um, the data. Mm -hmm. So any questions so far from other people doing the exercises? Are people generally still working on them or, um, or mostly done? There's a question from Ben. Does Seaborn have the ability to get these statistical value outs of the plot, right? Um, this is, yeah, this is an interesting question. I think the creators of Seaborn are um, specifically against getting statistics out of their plots. Uh, you could still do it with, you know, a lot of manipulation, uh, but it's not generally, um, something that it gives you. Right, and then Matt is asking, what does the jitter mean? So here, um, so the jitter is essentially, if you have a lot of data points on top of each other, uh, then they become really hard to see. Uh, so if you add a, a little bit of noise in one direction or, a, or the other, uh, they'll be much easier to see how many data points you actually have um, instead of just plotting them on top of each other. And we're going to see how that looks like in a minute. For Ben's question, I have been heard of the advantage of stats models package to return the statistical values of the plot, such as the QQ plot, quantile, quantile plot. But in Seaborn, you are kind of difficult to extract or retrieve the st statistical values, confidence intervals, any other interpretable statistics from the plot. Right. Um, and Seaborn does use stats models for a lot of things. It just doesn't make it easy to extract the results. Um, and I think intentionally doesn't make it easy to do that. Yeah, that intention is originally very good because for most of the uh, code written, it actually emphasized how to interpret based on visualization. So the statistical and interpretation of those plots, what it's the most what are the most important are given by the package itself. But you know, uh, if you like to do uh, more advanced statistical analyses, there is 
a very good Coursera course teaching how to do statistical analysis using Python. And that would actually tell you the different story of how to you know, plot statistically and interpret statistically. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, feel free to drop that in the chat if you want um, the course. And Chris asked another question, says, will a notebook with solutions be available after the tutorial? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I already answered in the chat, but yes, um, I will send out a notebook with the, uh, with the full solutions. Is that through email or is that through Hublio? I just help other people to ask that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be trying to do that via the PyCon platform uh, to, to everyone's emails. Um, I, I think that might be the best way to, to go. Absolutely. All right, I think um, ten minutes has passed, so let's uh, try to solve these together. Um, so let's first look at how this flights data set looks like. So we have years, months, and number of passengers per month. Um, and I think those are actually like the overall number of passengers per month for, for these years. I don't know, it's the, back in the 40s, it's, there were probably not that many air, air travel passengers. Uh, but anyway, uh, we wanna create a linear model plot. Um, so let's do that. And on the X, we want the year. On the Y, we want the number of passengers. The, date, um, the data is the data frame that we just defined. We're gonna color them by month. And let's just specify some height. All right, and what's, what that's kind of telling us is that um, in the summer months that are kind of green, bluish uh, colors, those essentially have higher number of passengers than the winter months, which kind of makes sense. All right, um, so now to look at this diamonds data set. So we have a lot of features about uh, different diamonds. Their carrot sizes, the cuts, the colors, clarity, and so on and so forth. Um, and now we're gonna also try to do a linear model plot. On the X, we want the carrot size. On the Y, uh, we're looking at the price. And we're, we're gonna color them by the color. Um, and essentially the color is whether a diamond is colorless, which is usually more expensive or um, more yellowish, which is usually less expensive. And the data is gonna be the data frame we just defined, uh, specify some height. And um, we, wanna, we wanna specify a marker that is really small. Um, so maybe a dot or even a comma, we can, we can try that if a dot doesn't look good. Um, and then we wanna specify an X jitter, which is just gonna add a little bit of noise. And um, we also said, let's make it a little, um, a little transparent. And we can do that by passing scatter keyword arguments, and we can pass them as a dictionary and essentially define alpha as something like 0.3, that's gonna give us 30% transparency. Um, let's also control the limits of this plot from zero to four on the x-axis. Um, and let's say 200 to, uh, to 20,000 on the y-axis. And it's gonna look something like this. 
Um, and essentially, you're going to, I'm not going to go through them in too much detail, but essentially, you're going to find that the lines at the top are the ones that correspond to the more colorless ones, um, which um, seems to indicate that the more colorless ones are pricier. And you could try to, for example, turn off the jitter and see how that looks like. It, it's going to look, um, I think, like a, like a bunch of stripes and um, a lot of points on top of each other, right? Which is going to make it, um, it's, it's really hard to interpret how many actual data points are here. Um, and the, the, the reason why they, they do look like stripes is because carrot sizes, you know, one or 1 1.5 or two or something like that, or a half uh, or 0.75, they kind of like set them, uh, try to make them as close as possible to certain numbers rather than, um, you know, being randomly distributed, um, you know, uniformly. And that's why we, you know, added some jitter here. And then our last uh, data set is the Titanic data set. And um, let's say how that how it looks like. It essentially gives us some information about the passengers on the Titanic. And the question is asking to make a, um, you know, box plot for um, um, for the price of the ticket sold for each of the two categories of whether someone survives or not. So we can do that with cat plot, X is survived, and Y is the fair price. Uh, kind, we're gonna do a uh, box. Data is the data frame, and then specify some height. And so essentially, it gives us some, um, some statistics on uh, what the fair price was for people who survived on the Titanic versus not, did not survive on the Titanic. All right, um, an another thing that I find really useful in my own work is uh, plotting things in polar coordinates or you know, changing the coordinates. Things are not always X and Y, uh, so you might want to plot them in different coordinates. Um, so before we do that, we're going to introduce this thing called a quiver plot. And this essentially um, draws a bunch of um, arrows instead of points, it draws arrows. And um, we could look at, you know, exactly uh, if you press shift tab in a Jupyter notebook, it's going to give us some documentation on this. Uh, or if you run this cell, it's also going to give us some documentation here. Uh, but essentially, it's going to, we, we, it needs an X and Y uh, that correspond to the positions. And um, as well as the y, the u and v and those are going to be uh, the projection the projections of this arrow in the x and y direction uh, so u equals one and v equals zero is essentially going to give us something horizontal um, so you know tr trying to do something pretty similar uh, sorry pretty uh, simple so x just spans from zero to ten. Uh, uniformly, y uh, spans from 0 to 1, uh, and then u and v are all ones. And then um, instead of drawing an arrow, I'm just going to uh, not draw the head, the head of the arrow. Uh, so it's just going to look like a stick. And let's see how it looks like. All right, so uh, the reason why it's all 45 degrees is because the u and the v are the same. So essentially, we're saying, um, you know, the, the projection on the x-axis and the y-axis are the same. 
In other words, uh, the cosine of the angles and the sine of the angles are the same. So we, we end up with a 45 degree uh, sticks. Um, we could do something a little more uh, complicated in uh, polar coordinates. So now we can set polar equals to true. And essentially, uh, instead of x and y, it's going to be theta and r, where theta is the angle and r is the position of the starting point of the stick. And we're going to, theta is going to go from 0 to 2 pi um, linearly. And r is going to go from 0 to 1 linearly. Um, so what we expect here is that, um, is that the radius or, or r, which is the position where the starting point of the stick is going to go uniformly up. And the angle of those sticks is also going to go um, uniformly from 0 to 360 degrees. And as I mentioned earlier, u and v are essentially cosine and sine of theta. Um, I have some, you know, uh, some extra stuff here uh, for you know accuracy, but these are all zeros, and these are d dr is also one in this case. So it ends up being just cosine of theta and sine of theta, and it's going to look something like this. We now have a polar coordinate plot. Um, instead of an x and y axis, we have an r and theta axis, essentially. Um, so now let's try. So what this thing is here is going to do is, is essentially the only difference from here to here is that the r is not going to be um, Uniform is not going to is not going to be linearly spaced anymore, but it's going to be random according to a uniform distribution from zero and one. So it's, instead of it going uniformly up, it's it's going to have random um, random positions throughout. And just like here, the sticks always point to the center. Uh, so we have a couple of exercises here. Uh, we're going to pause for another couple of minutes for them. And essentially, um, it's, it's just all small modifications of this code uh, that you're going to you know, copy this code in, do some small modifications to uh, try to do uh, what the exercise is asking for. And we're going to stop for a couple of minutes here. Feel free to ask any questions as you uh, go through the exercises. Thank you, Hasli. So whenever you have any questions during the exercise, you can ask. And I invite you to unmute yourself when you got a question, got a long question, an urgent question especially. <laughs> Hasli, do you think matplotlib's quiver function, the most convenient package to plot those radius plot? Radial um, plot? You, you, mean, you mean to plot something in polar coordinates? Yep. So you, do, you don't really need the, the quiver plot at all. Um, all you need for polar coordinates is just to set polar equal true in um, when you add a subplot to a matplotlib figure. Um, I kind of in introduced this um, because just because it's a kind of a different kind of plot and it um, kind of forces you to think about angles uh, because of the u and the v function uh, parameters. But it's yeah, it's it's completely unrelated to um, um, creating polar plots. I see. That piece of information is very helpful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
are everyone doing okay on the exercises? Any questions at all or? Cool. Um, let's. Great. What is a mulwide projection? Um, so it's essentially, um, it's essentially, you know, the closest thing you could plot an earth, a map of Earth on. You could project a map of Earth on, um, and it kind of um, preserves areas as much as possible. Because when you think about a map of Earth uh, that is, you know, a rectangle. Areas are uh, not uh, what they truly are uh, when you look at the North Pole versus the, the equator. Uh, it distorts areas a lot, and a mulwide projection tries to correct for that as much as possible. And we're going to uh, see how it actually looks like in a, in a little bit. So let's actually try to um, solve these. So. I'm going to copy this as is in here. We want a radial plot with all six starting at a radius of one. This is already a radial plot. We want uh, everything to start at a radius of one. So I'm just going to change this into one and run it. And we get um, what we asked for. The second exercise is to have all six horizontal. So let's copy this again. Oops. Um, let's paste it here. And if we want everything horizontal, uh, we want the X projection to be one and the Y projection, pr projection to be zero. So essentially the cosine of theta we force it to be one sine of theta, we force it to be zero. And we get all horizontal. And then let's see how we can do the last one. Um, so if we copy this over here, and instead of saying polar equal true, we're gonna say projection equals mul wide. So if we run that, we we end up with uh, this is essentially what a mulwide projection is, uh, but we find that it's only spanning a portion. So instead of it running from zero to two pi, uh, let's instead run it from minus pi to pi, and instead of running from zero to one in the position, let's run it from minus one to one. And that should cover um, the entire area. There's a question from the chat from Josh saying, what is a mobile projection? Could you elaborate more about what forms a mobile projection? Uh, yeah, so I tried to answer that uh, a little bit earlier. Um, so this is essentially a mobile projection. It tries to make sure that areas are not distorted when plotting a map of a globe. Um, so something like, if you wanna plot a map of something like Earth, a mulwide projection is, um, is a much better way to plot it than just on an XY you know, um, rectangular plot. Because it preserves areas uh, and makes sure that areas are what they are truly um, and not not, are, and are not distorted like in a rectangular plot. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, so let's have a five minute break here um, before we go into high dimensional data sets. Um, 
And as always, uh, feel free to ask anything in the chat or, um, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer throughout. Um, and yeah. So I have a question again about a different question, kind of about the mole, mole wide. I think this is awesome. So if I wanted to show maybe locations in Europe, is there a way I could show that we're using the mole wide for just a portion, like a quarter of the globe, just to get an idea, like they could show the more realistic distance because that is more realistic than a ball. Right. Right. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, if you want to just take a part of here, and just show that uh, specific part. Uh, so in, in, the, in, in the fourth section of this tutorial, we're gonna talk a bit about uh, choropleth plots. And those are essentially gonna be, um, you know, more specific geographical plots. Um, but for, for this, it's essentially gonna show you, um, you know, the entire mole white projection. Um, I, I guess you could try to, Let's try to just set X limits, for example. I don't know if, how that's gonna look like. Okay, that's not supported for a geographical projection. Um, right, so Matplotlib is But you said we're gonna there. cover something that- Yeah, we're gonna cover something uh, that's gonna look more deeply into geographical plots in a bit. Thank you. Sure. I think there are packages like Plotly, Geos Pandas, EarthPy are good. Yeah, we're going to be working in Plotly in a bit. Um, and particularly for plotting the Earth projection, I encourage somebody who have more time after the tutorial can go on to read the EarthPy documentation. That's the package uh, that will invite you to customize a bit about the area that you would like to visualize in a globe. And you can customize its shape, its colors, and it's like the range of latitude and longitude. And that's probably one of the most powerful way of visualizing the globe and part of the globe. That's great. Nope, anytime. And I also invite any other people who have questions to raise the questions so that we can try to explore the question even deeper.
All right, cool. Um, let's continue on on our third section of this tutorial and on visualizing high dimensional data sets. So a lot of the times we have data sets that um, you know, are not just X and Y, but have a lot of dimensions. And it can be you know, really difficult to visualize them um, in a single plot or something like that. So for this case, we're gonna look at a data set of handwritten digits. Uh, we can import it from, C, uh, from scikit-learn and then essentially um, it's that many data points and each data point is 64 uh, dimensions. And essentially each one of those dimensions is a pixel. So it's, it's 64 pixels. And we can use Imshaw um, to look at how one of those look like. So this is what a zero looks like. Um, this is what like a six looks like uh, in this data set of handwritten digits. If you want another six, uh, we could look at 16 or 26 and so on. Like a nine. Um, so essentially you can get this to plot uh, for you, um, you know, how those handwritten digits look like. And um, the, the idea here is that, yes, we have 64 pixels, but do we actually need 64 dimensions to differentiate a one from a two, from a three and so on? So we're gonna be trying to use a few methods to reduce the dimensionality of this data set to uh, lower dimensions, to so something like two dimensions and see if we can still separate the ones from the twos from the threes um, just, just in two dimensions rather than in these 64 dimensions. Uh, so first I'm gonna talk about something called principal component analysis. Uh, and this is an idea in machine learning Essentially, it says that if you have a bunch of data, then you can reduce the dimensionality by finding uh, the axes that maximize the variance between these data points. So to show a, a simple, quick example, if we have, um, if we have this you know, bunch of data points, now these are two dimensional, uh, but the question here is, do we actually need two dimensions to understand, uh, you know, to, to differentiate these data points. And, um, you know, it's, it's clear that we don't because they are actually one dimensional. If we just, just rotate that X axis by 45 degrees, then they just all lie on that new X axis. Um, so essentially we don't really need uh, two dimensions to plot these data points. And, um, by PCA, by using PCA, it's going to do that for us. It's going to find this axis uh, that when these points are projected on, it, it, these points can be differentiated the most, which is this axis that is a 45 degree line between the X and Y axes. Um, so scikit-learn makes it pretty easy to use any machine learning um, you know, method we want. We can just uh, import it here in the first line. In the second line, we're initializing this principal component analysis, and we want the result to be in just one dimension. That's what this one is. Um, and then we're going to fit it to uh, this, this data, where the x and y are essentially these x and y's. So, we already got our um, you know, new data points in this new uh, projected space stored in principal components. And we can plot them all on the x-axis. And I'm just gonna plot zeros on the y-axis uh, just so it wouldn't you know, give me any errors or something like that. And we get these data points. And one thing that's interesting about these data points is that uh, the distances between them are square root of two. 
which is the distances between you know every two data points here because if you you know do a simple pythagoras theory it's you know a is 1 b is 1 so c is square root of 2 so this pca essentially found this axis that maximizes the variance between these data points and is able to differentiate them the most and reduce the dimensionality of this you know simple fake data set from two dimensions to one dimension so now let's try to do that for the digits. So if we you know, start a new uh, PCA and then let's have two dimensions in it instead of 64, and then we're gonna fit it, we're gonna fit the data, digits data to it. And now we're essentially gonna plot um, you know, the first principal component or the first axis um, from the result of this PCA, and then the second axis. And then we're gonna color each data point by the digit it actually is. And then here I'm adding no edge colors and 50% uh, you know, transparency and asking for uh, colors from this paired color maps and asking for 10 colors since there are 10 digits and plotting a color bar. So let's see how that looks like. Right, so this PCA did a pretty okay job uh, for like a couple lines of code to differentiate the zeros from the ones, from the twos and so on. So you can see that most of the zeros are actually in this area um, in the light blue. And most of the ones are in this area in the slightly darker blue. In the green, the twos are here and so on and so forth. So even in two dimensions, we were able to visualize, um, you know, all of these handwritten digits that are, are originally in 64 dimensions. Now let's try to do a, a little harder example. We're gonna do something called a, a Swiss roll. I'm, I'm not gonna go uh, in too much detail into what this code is doing, but it's essentially generating this Swiss roll for us. And, you know, it, it looks like this. And the reason why this is difficult um, is because it's nonlinear. So if we want to differentiate data points, we want to differentiate, you know, say the green from the orange, um, it, it, it the, the, the only way to essentially project this in two dimensions or to lower the dimensionality of it is to spread it out or to unfold the Swiss roll. Uh, now that is something that PCA cannot do because it's not suited for nonlinear problems. And we can try to do that here. So essentially we're running the same code that we ran on the digits. Um, so if we run it here, it essentially does pretty much nothing. And um, then the question is, what do we do in these cases where something is highly nonlinear and we can't use PCA4 and we still want to, you know, visualize something that has a high number of dimensions on a 2D plot? There are a bunch of methods to do this. Uh, one of my favorites is called a t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. Um, now, this is a machine learning method that's, you know, uh, you don't need to really understand it completely um, since this is not a machine learning course, but I wanted to you know, include it anyway. Um, and what it, what it essentially does is that it tries to find um, a lower dimensional embedding of this high dimensional data set that tries to preserve the local distances between every two data points, essentially. So it's trying to preserve local similarity uh, and not project it all, um, you know, on one um, on one, you know, axis like the PCA does. It it just tries to preserve local similarity between data points, uh, which seems suited to a problem like a Swiss roll because we want to unfold it. We want to preserve this local similarity between those data points. Uh, now, there is a stochastic word in the name, which means that every time you're going to run it, it might look a little different. 
So when you run it um, on your own machines, it's gonna look a bit different from how it's gonna look on, um, you know, on my screen and that's okay. Um, so here we're gonna import this TSNE from scikit-learn and we're gonna run it with some, um, you know, some parameters um, that specify, you know, uh, how, how fast it should be learning uh, the similarity between data points and things like that. Uh, and then we're gonna fit this data uh, to the TSNE object the same way as we did with the PCA. And here we're also plotting essentially uh, the Swiss roll, but the projected parameters of it. Uh, we're gonna color them by the same colors as they were colored here. And um, I glossed over this a little bit, but there are five clusters in the Swiss roll. Um, so we're gonna need five colors. And we're asking for five colors from the paired uh, color map. And we're setting a transparency to 30%. So let's see how that looks like. All right, so it, what it actually did is it actually unfolded the Swiss roll into five clusters that now we can separate um, you know, by position, which the PCA was not able to do. Now, if you run it again, it might look a little different and feel free to also change those hyperparameters and see um, how that might look as well. Now for a short exercise, uh, try to do this, but for the digits data set. And we're gonna pause for uh, maybe five minutes or so here uh, while you try this. And as always, if there's any questions, I know this, this part is probably one of the harder parts of this tutorial because it involves a lot of uh, statistics and machine learning. I have added uh, some links here to read uh, and view to have like some more additional background reading on this. Um, since, you know, explaining all the machine learning stuff is probably beyond the scope of this tutorial. Uh, but yeah, feel free to ask any questions while we're here. I noticed that since 2008, TSNE has gained wider and wider popularity in academia. My question is why TSNE becomes one of the most widely used method for clustering? Right, um, so, you know, you could use something like k-means or something mm -hmm. basic like that for mm -hmm. clustering. Uh, but there's a problem that you get into when you're trying to create clusters in very high dimensions. And that problem is called the curse of dimensionality. And essentially what it is, is that distances become really large in high dimensions. So the distance between two, di two data points, if they're, you know, if, if the distance between them is one in two dimensions, it could be in, in like a thousand or a million dimensions, it could be you know, unreasonable to uh, calculate just the distances between every two data points. And that's why you can't use k-means anymore in that case. Uh, because you're in k-means, you're iteratively trying to um, you know, calculate the distances and take the average of those distances um, to create your clusters. So the reason why you know, something like TSNE has gained popularity, I'll also mention another one called uh, UMAP, uh, which has also been, ga been, been gaining popularity in academia. Um, those methods have become you know, really useful to first lower down the dimensionality of your data so you can um, 
you, you don't run into this problem of trying to calculate distances between data points in very high dimensions anymore. Thank you so much. Sure. All right, I um, hope everyone had a chance to try this exercise on their own. Um, let's try to solve this together. So essentially, I'm gonna copy some stuff from here. I do a lot of copy pasting in my day-to-day -day coding. Um, and that that's probably shows in this tutorial. But anyway, um, if we copy this uh, down here, and now instead of fitting this X, whatever that was, let's fit the digits data. And essentially we can also just copy the plotting code because projected now is gonna be um, the result of applying TSNE to the digits data. Um, the only difference is that there are 10 digits, so I'm gonna change the number of colors to 10 and just plot that, oops. Right, so the colors are gonna be the target digits. So let's change that. Cool, and we can also plot a color bar here. So as you see, the TSNE did a really good job at separating every digit uh, on its own. Uh, maybe not the one too much, but every other digit uh, got separated into its own cluster. Um, so even though these digits were in 64 dimensions, we were able to plot them uh, and be able to distinguish each data point on its own just in two dimensions by applying TSNE. 
did, did everyone else get a similar plot? Right, so how we have a question that's how would you describe those X and Y uh, dimensions? So it's it's actually really hard to um, interpret, you know, what what those two dimensions are. But essentially, those are the two dimensions that the the, the Disney me method uh, decided um, are the two dimensions that could separate, um, you know, the code um, the most. And as I meant, as I uh, said at the start, uh, this method is trying to preserve the local sim similarity between the data points but not the global similarity. So uh, something that we can interpret from this plot is that two data points here that are closer together are very similar. And two data points that are not close together are not similar. But we cannot interpret that um, the nines are more similar to the threes than the twos. So we can interpret that each cluster has similar data points and every two clusters have different data points, uh, but we cannot interpret global distances from this method. So um, global distances don't mean much. So you know, having a cluster at plus 20 and a cluster at minus 40 does not really mean much. I hope that, that um, helps a little. All right, um, so let's have a final five minute break. Um, and um, We'll, we'll start again at 5 p.m. And uh, I think there are more questions, so I'm gonna try to do those um, in this break. Uh, but then uh, at 5 p.m., essentially, we're gonna start our last two sections for today. Cool. So I also received another question from the chat. Josh um, asked, with the ones in three different clusters, would that mean that there are probably three different ways that people drew their ones? I, I could imagine that to be true. Um, I could imagine you know, a cluster being ones uh, that is just a single line, another cluster being one uh, with you know, a dash um, you know, below it, and one having a dash at the top to indicate the one. Um, so that, that is, that is the most likely situation, um, you know, to confirm, you might actually want to figure out which data point this is and try to plot it and, you know, compare all three clusters, but that is, that is the most likely situation is that each, each one of those clusters has people drawing their ones in, in a different way, which, yeah. And um, yeah, as I you know just mentioned um, to Ben's question, um, the, this method indicates that you know this cluster of one looks different than this cluster of one, uh, but it does not say that um, this cluster of one is is more similar to two than this cluster of one. Like global distances should not be uh, interpreted only local only local distances.
speaking with the computational cost, has the would you think there are great ways to reduce the computational cost to plot the PSNE plots for you know to not only get a good performance on the local structure of the clustering, but also be quick. Great. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, TSNE is very is not very quick, um, especially if you have like thousands of dimensions. So the general advice here is to uh, use PCA first to reduce your dimensionality from like maybe, I don't know, 10,000 to 50. And then once you have your 50 dimensions, you can run TSNE on them uh, instead of on your overall data set. Uh, usually because you don't have, you know, tens of thousands of nonlinear dimensions, you usually have something like 50 nonlinear dimensions uh, that could describe your data um, almost as, as well as the, you know, 10,000 dimensions. So yeah, if you have too many dimensions, run, uh, run PCA on them first, reduce them to something like 50 dimensions, and then run TSNE again. So that means using the data, which is of the reduced dimensionality, rather than using the full data to use the TSNE visualize the clusters to reduce right. the computational cost for showing the plot to the audience, right? That's right. As a general advice of using PCA, would you advise mm, people to reduce the dimensionality such that like 95% of the variability of the model are captured or you would advise in choosing the dimensionality that you think like less than five or less than three in, in terms of the time? Great. In sick um, of the I, time, sorry. Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend to check um, what is the total variance that is captured by each dimension uh, before making that decision. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, um, if, if you think you only need to describe 95% of the information of your data and those 95% um, are captured by three dimensions, then that's a, that's a reasonable number of dimensions to use. Um, I, I think that would be a better way uh, to, to go um, than you know, specifying the number of dimensions, unless you already know that you only have you know, a certain number of dimensions that are important. For example, in this you know, super simple example here, we already knew that there's only one dimension that's important here. Um, and then, yeah. So otherwise I would recommend to actually um, find the uh, total variance captured by each dimension and base, base the decision off of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, based on my research experience, if most of the time capturing 20% of the uh, all features, it's probably 90% of the case you can capture 90% of variabilities. Especially right. uh, when dealing with some like behavioral data set, like educational data mining. Right. And screen right. plot is very great to show the variability capture for each dimension included. And that the plot which shows the highest variability for the uh, first dimension included, the second highest variability for the second dimension included shows in like a bar chart. Right. Yeah, that, that would be, um, you know, the perfect thing to look at before, you know, making the decision on, on uh, how many dimensions you want to use, I would say. Yeah. So yeah, please point. go ahead for the last section of interactive visualization. Hasni. All right, sounds good. Um, 
So, you know, we've talked about a lot of figures. One really interesting kind of figure is, is a figure you can interact with and that can be really useful if you just wanna, you know, interact with your data, if you have a lot of data or you just wanna, um, you know, zoom in, zoom out, select a certain um, data point, things like that. Uh, so for that, we're gonna use Plotly. Um, so let's import some um, libraries. I'm also importing this uh, Pandas data reader, which is gonna fetch uh, stock data, like financial stock data in real time from Yahoo Finance. Um, and I'm also gonna use the date time uh, library, which is Python standard library, just to uh, handle uh, the dates and times uh, that we're gonna fetch the data uh, with in a, in a better way. So let's specify start and date, uh, start, and, start and end date as uh, start of 2008 to start of 2018. And um, we're gonna fetch the SP SPY, which is the S&P 500 index from Yahoo Finance from start date to end date. And um, let's see how that looks like. So here we have one data point per day. It's gonna tell us what the high uh, price in that day, what the low price uh, what the price it opened in and closed in, and how much was traded, um, as well as the adjusted close date. So, if if we want to, um, you know, make an interactive plot of um, just the time series plot of the closing price as um, as a function of date, then we are essentially going to do uh, GO, which is graph objects from Plotly, dot scatter. We're gonna specify X to be uh, the date in this data frame, the Y to be the closing price. And we're gonna plot, you know, go, go to figure um, and we, it's just gonna plot this data. And hopefully everyone got something that looks like this. And the really cool thing about Plotly is now you can interact with, with your data so you can hover on, on things and uh, get more information about them. Uh, you can zoom in um, just by dragging along the screen. Uh, you can double click to zoom all the way back. Um, and um, you know, that's, that's a very basic interactive plot that um, we can make. Um, a, a simple exercise here is asking to, instead of doing this scatter plot, uh, try to do a candlestick chart, uh, which is a common financial chart. Uh, it essentially um, plots the opening, um, you know, the opening and the closing and the low and the high price all on one chart. So try to do that for the first 90 days of this data frame that we have. And um, yeah. A hint here says that the candlestick is in the Go module. So if you do go dot um, candlestick and then do shift tab, you can read uh, some documentation on this. I think it, it has to be a capital C here for candlestick. The candlestick plot can show us the bullish pattern and the bearish pattern. Yeah, exactly. With different colors and uh, yeah. Showing it's uh, green or red color. And you can act actually customize different colors as you want. But right. by default, it's uh, green and red. That's right. It shows uh, the trend for each day or each period. The larger of the candlestick means the uh, changes of the stock value is great. <laughs> right. So yeah, let's actually try to do that uh, in the interest of time. Um, so let's create our data. Um, it's a candlestick chart. The exposition is gonna is gonna be. Uh, the date again, but we're only going to take the first 90 days. Um, 
And then the open price is going to be dot open. It closes again the data frame dot close and so on. Is there an easy way to add a legend that shows like red is for closing down and green is for closing up? Yeah, we're, we're gonna look uh, more into, um, you know, adding more, um, you know, layouts and titles and legends and things like that in the following cells. We're, we're gonna build, in, build, build up to that. Uh, but essentially you get, you know, a candlestick chart here um, each candle stick is going to show you the low price, which is the bottom of the stick, the high price, which is the top of the stick. And then the, the box here is going to show you the, the open and close. Um, and if it's green, it means it closed higher than it opened. If it's red, it means it closed lower than it opened. Uh, now here in our data, we just had you know a, a single um, single trace of just the SPY data. Um, we can also include, say, the Apple stock data. So the same way as we fetched this SPY data, we're going to fetch Apple stock, um, and then do the same. Uh, we're going to define a new layout. And the layout is going to be a dictionary of, um, you know, diff different things um, that's going to make the make the plot look better, like the uh, title or the uh, um, axis labels and things like that. So now we essentially get, um, you know, those two traces. You could also, you know, click on one of them to show or hide it. And again, zoom and hover and all of these things. And now to define a little more uh, stuff in there. Um, so this update menus is gonna, you know, one of the things you might want to use interactive visualization for is to actually have some buttons in your plot to uh, change things around. So here we're gonna add a button where when you press it, it's only gonna show SPY, another button, uh, it's only gonna show Apple stock and then another button, it's, all, it's gonna show both. And essentially you define these visible uh, according to the order of your data. So the first element in our data is the SPY, the second is the Apple stock, so for the SPY button, we want, we want to define true for the, for the first and false for the latter. Um, the opposite is true for the Apple stock. And then for both, we, wanna, we want both to be visible. And now our layout is just going to include this update menus. And we're going to plot that again. And now we can use this drop down menu to click on different um, on different buttons, and you know the title is going to change depending on the on which button we press, um, as well as what's in the plot itself. Um, I'm I'm probably going to skip this exercise in the interest of time. Um, but essentially it's asking to, you know, find a better way to compare those, the return of those two, um, 
you know, this index and this stock. And um, essentially what we're gonna do is that we're gonna divide them by um, the, the, the closing price on the first day. So instead of just showing the pure price, we're gonna show the price divided by, um, you know, as a, as a um, ratio to the first day. And that's the only thing that changed um, in the cell. Everything else is exactly the same as the previous cell. And now we're, we get that, you know, we start at one. Um, if we go down, then, um, you know, you're, you're losing money. If you go above one, you're making money. Uh, after 10 years with Apple stock, it, uh, the price is six times as much as it was in 2008. All right, is anyone having any issues with these plots? Um, I, I'm seeing some comments regarding that. So um, if things are not working out for Plotly, I would recommend um, starting, you know, working in this uh, Google Colab uh, because it's gonna be the same for everyone and it's gonna, um, you know, look like, look the same for everyone. So if, if you are having, you know, I'm seeing some JavaScript errors um, in the comments that I would probably not be able to um, fix on the fly. If you're running in those, into those problems, I would, um, you know, recommend trying to, um, use this collab version. And I'm gonna uh, share it again in, the, in here. Of course, you could also try to reinstall and upgrade Plotly um, and hopefully, yeah, that, that might fix things. All right, um, this next example, we're actually gonna use some geographical data. So if you run this line, it's gonna uh, download the data to your computer. Uh, if you don't have wget, you can also use curl. Um, you might have curl. Um, if neither of those commands work, um, then you could just go here with your browser and just um, save that file. In, basically into wherever you're working. But it's, a, it's just a you know, CSV uh, text file that just should take you know, just a second to download. And then we're just gonna read this in uh, by pandas. And essentially it's, it's gonna look at um, you know, the COVID confirmed cases uh, over, over time, back from uh, 2020, uh, January 2020, and uh, by county for each state. <clears throat> so Plotly can create those choropleth plots that I uh, mentioned a little bit earlier. And essentially, um, to, to specify geographies, you wanna have this FIPS, um, and that's essentially has a specific, um, it has a specific number for every county or every city or every state, wherever you are. Um, so it's, it's a very you know, local identifier that's gonna identify where you want this plot to be uh, plotted. And then the value is gonna, just gonna be essentially the color how uh, dark or how bright or whatever you specify the color scale to be um, in, that, in that county, essentially. 
Um, so I'm creating, um, you know, a color scale that's actually, that's, you know, just light blue to dark blue. You can specify it yourself or you can, um, you know, um, just use a predetermined one. So here you could either use, you know, color scale, you could replace this by color scale, uh, but you could also just use the blue color scale that they have and ignore this. And um, this endpoints is essentially making this color scale logarithmic uh, rather than linear. Uh, so essentially the color is gonna change every time a, a new county has more than 10 times uh, the number of cases than the previous county. And if we run this, might take a little bit and it might throw a few warnings that there are some invalid FIPS um, points, but that's okay. And we get something like this, um, where we have a legend here that's showing, um, you know, the number of cases for each uh, for you know each category for each color, and um, you know every county in the in the U.S. And of course, you could do this for you know any other country. It was just the easiest um, data that I could find was for the U.S. Uh, so one another thing we could do with interactive visualization is to uh, create some animations. And this is what I'm going to try to do here. Um, so in this cell, I'm just manipulating the data frame a little bit uh, to look like this. So for every state, it's going to show for each day what the total number of cases are. And Plotly through Plotly Express, um, you know, you can just make a simple scatter plot, give it this data, uh, specify X as the state, Y is the number of cases, and then specify this animation frame uh, argument. And this is basically gonna, um, you know, every frame is gonna be another date. And here I'm specifying a range from zero to 50,000 cases. Um, I'm gonna color by, make a color scale that's uh, colored by cases. And my color scale is gonna be red. So uh, states that have low number of cases are gonna be um, you know, almost white or very, very light red. Whereas states with higher number of cases are gonna have um, you know, redder color. Um, this line is essentially controlling the speed of the animation. Uh, so here it's 100 milliseconds. And this line is just hiding the color bar because the color bar is going to be adaptive to each day is going to change. And it could be really distracting if we keep, um, if it, you know, keeps changing in front of you the whole time. So let's see how that looks like. So we get something like this, and you could press this to run this animation. So here we have the dates, and it's running through them, um, and it's going to show you, you know, every state what the total number of cases are, and the redder it is, um, the higher it is. Right, and you can of course, you know, just pick, um, 
a, a specific frame um, from this bar or you know let later run through. Um, I see a question in the chat and um, if possible, let's let's uh, do that in the lounge room after this tutorial since we only have five minutes um, left. So in, in the last uh, part of this tutorial, it's only going to be, you know, a few recommendations um, and a few, you know, common mistakes about, um, you know, what, what you should and shouldn't do in your plots. For, so for a long time, there was this color map called Jet, and it was basically, it looks like a rainbow, it looks like this. Um, and it was very widely used in science and academia and in, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of places. And um, the reason it's really bad is because the saturation is going to change non-uniformly from start to finish. So let's see how that means. So this code, um, I, I took it from uh, Jake van der Plaats's blog, and it's essentially just going to turn this color map into um, grayscale. So if we look back at the flights data set and get a, get a heat map with this jet um, color map, you will essentially find that the most striking uh, feature is here, not, not in the red, but rather in the yellow greenish area because it has the highest saturation, uh, where, whereas the red and the blue areas actually kind of look similar for the eye but they are actually the most distinct um, areas on this plot. And if we look at this in grayscale, it looks, um, you know, as I said, the, the area that we want to highlight is actually not highlighted. And the area that's right in the middle, that's probably not what you want to highlight is the one that gets highlighted. So when you want it, when you choose color maps, you want to choose. There's like three main ways you can choose them. Uh, one is if if you want sequential colors, and uh, the new uh, standard in Matplotlib is this Veridis color map, and it looks like this, and it has a nice you know perceptually uniform change from low to high. You can also look at a single color and take you know degrees of saturations. So if we specify purples, we get from very light purple to very dark purple. It's also very nice and conceptually uniform. Uh, you could also pick diverging color, color maps. So here I just took some data from Google um, on what the climate looks like in Pittsburgh where I'm in. Um, and it's essentially just a month and what the high and low in Celsius are. And if we, um, we can you know, plot this in a diverging cool to warm um, color scale and center it around zero, which is freezing point. And we could see you know, that blue is gonna be below freezing, red is gonna be above freezing. So that is one use case for not using a perceptually uniform color map. Uh, the third way is to use categorical colors, obviously. Uh, and we've used, for example, paired, uh, the paired color map before. Uh, this was the digits data set. Um, you could also use, um, you know, probably one of the best color palettes uh, that you would want to use is the colorblind friendly one. And as I've done at the start of this notebook, you can just set it for the entirety of this notebook by just doing sns.setpalette and specify which uh, color map you want to use for the rest of this uh, color palette. Um, other than color, you should also, you know, look at, um, you know, make sure things that look diff that you want to um, make sure um, to identify more easily look different in your plots. So for example, if you plot, um, you know, pluses and, and circles, 
this is pretty good because you can immediately see where the five dots are. You don't have to take too much time to look through the sea of pluses. Uh, so you just want to make sure that your plots, uh, the different things in your plot look different if you want to identify them in a, in a better way. You could use a combination of color and shape. So here I'm using, if, if you were to just use the shape, the shape is very similar. It's just the orientation is different. But if you use color plus shape, it, it would make for a much better distinction uh, than just using one of those. And then finally, remember that even though your plot on two dimensional screens, you could add more information to your plots more beyond two dimensions. Uh, for example, by using the color or the size or the shape. Um, and then uh, you can use each of those to, you know, um, highlight a different dimension or a different feature in your data set. Or you could just make a 3D plot if it's actually three dimension, if what you're plotting is actually three dimensional in physical space. And finally, I have a list here of what some research has found uh, about what is the most, uh, you know, visual attributes uh, what, what are the most important visual attributes when trying to plot quantitative, sequential, and categorical data? And this is something I look back to, um, you know, every, every, um, every, every time I'm making a plot, essentially. And finally, I just have some, um, you know, references for you to look over um, if you want to, you know, learn more about, you know, picking the right color map, the right shape for your data points, and things like that. And um, that essentially concludes uh, this tutorial. And um, I, I just saw that Insan uh, is, is messaging me that uh, we could actually go on for 15 extra minutes for Q&A. Uh, so I'm happy to uh, stay here for you know, longer and uh, take more questions, um, as well as um, later on in the Hubilo lounge room as well. Thanks everyone for joining.